the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome to worship and welcome to the second week in Advent where we remember and give thanks for the Prince of Peace who has come and who is coming again. And so we say with the confidence of the Prince of Peace that our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Amen. There are many stories. Today we choose the story of peace. Where there is violence, where there is war, where we are told that it is us versus them. May your peace rule, may your kingdom come. May your kingdom come so that you may guide us into the way of peace. Help us declare the gospel of peace. As the prophet Isaiah says to us, Get you up to a high mountain, herald of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Prepare the way of the Lord. In the wilderness, make straight paths for our God. There are many stories. Today, let us tell the story of the peace of our God, the story of Jesus, the Messiah. Come, Lord Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Having been welcomed by God, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, you have created us for relationship, relationship with you, relationship with one another, relationship with your world. You have shown us steadfast loving kindness in keeping us in covenant with you. Forgive us, God, for our resistance to your love. Forgive us for our resistance to the relationships you have created us for. Restore us to the right relationship in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. People of God, hear the good news. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. God had heard our cry and come near to us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Well, all right, at this time, I would like to welcome all the kids to come join me by the tree. All right, how's it going, everybody? We're doing all right today? Good. I am so glad for that. There we go. I am so glad for that. I uh, forgot something last week, and that was, do you remember, so last week we hung up the staff, do you remember that, and we talked about how we're going to have a new ornament to hang every week, and then I just put one on the tree, but like, we all should have put one on the tree, right? It shouldn't just be one, it should be everybody puts one on the tree, right? Because look at all these, doesn't the tree look better with lots of ornaments? If we still had only one ornament up there, like, that wouldn't look so great, right? So here's the thing. This week, we have a new ornament. Who can tell me what this is? A bird? That's right! What kind of bird? What kind of bird? Um, it's eagle. Ooh, it's not an eagle. Good guess. It's a dove, yeah. This is a dove. 
Pretty cool, right? Does the bird look like it's flying way back there? All right. So who, who can tell me what does, do, and this is kind of a tough question, right? Because a dove means something in our Bible. There's stories about doves, and it means something. Who can tell me what it means? Harper? Yes, all right. Good memory to our sermon series in the fall, right? It's in the story of Noah. What does the dove do? It flies out and comes back, and it has something in its beak. Do you remember what it was? Somebody, a le- yes. Bonus points, what kind of leaf? Or what kind of branch? Olive branch, yes. Bonus points. You get a million and a half bonus points. All right. I don't know what scale that's on. It feels right. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and what, yes, Gabriel, do you have another story? Yeah, the shape of an ornament kind of is a heart. Yeah, that's awesome, right? So a dove can also be a sign in addition to like God's covenant faithfulness or a sign of the Holy Spirit. It is also a symbol of peace. And that is the second uh, week in Advent that we're on. So I need your help. If you would like, you don't have to, but if you would like to hang an ornament on the tree, will you come do that with me? Does anybody want to come hang an ornament? All right, here you go. Come hang, come find a branch. You want to hang one, Will? Everybody can hang one. If you want to hang one, you should hang one. Yeah, come on up. Just come on up. Really high? All right. If you, oh, here you go. There's right there. And you can find your way all around. This is, this is awesome. That was a great job, Gabriel. Yeah, I like it. Wherever you put them is, is great. Here you go, Isla. All right. What? Ten weeks, you'll be six? Oh, that's awesome. Ten weeks away. Let's count down. Can we leave the picture? Yeah, that's the baptism water. That's right. It is wet. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hang one right here because that looks awesome there. All right. Oh, this is so much better than last week. We really upped our <laughs> ornament game, and I'm happy about that. Oh, thank you so much. Well, so today, and there's, by the way, there's ornaments left, and not many of you grabbed some. I think it was because my tone last week. I apologize for that. Like, you should get ornaments, though, and hang them on your tree. They're going to be right here. We're going to put them on a stand right here. A lot of you couldn't find them last week. That must have been it, because there's no way that you would see these ornaments and not take one. So we're going to put them right here, and, uh, I'm, and we'll, that, they will be there after the service. So you can grab a staff, you can grab a dove, because that's what we're talking about this week. So, as we talk about uh, the dove and a representation of peace, we're going to pray to Jesus, who's our Prince of Peace, and we're going to be dismissed to our class. Now, Reagan, remind me, everybody through fifth grade is going again to practice some songs? Nope. No? Children in worship. Children in worship. And a call to worship practice for next week in Young Levites. Okay, would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks, for you are our peace. You grant us through your son, Jesus, peace, wholeness. Thank you for that, God. Help us to also show peace in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends, for hanging the ornaments. You can go to uh, everyone up to second grade, can go to children in worship with Miss Catherine, and then third through fifth grade can go to young Levites. And if you want to just gather at the coloring table, if neither of those applies to you, you may do that. Thanks for coming up. Yep, you can go. You can go. Yep. Apply it to our lives. Give us the courage to follow you, your will, and strength to do it what is right. We pray that your light would shine upon us and lead us on the right path. Amen. 
This morning, our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In a word before the gospel reading this morning, <clears throat> we are in a series called The Two Stories. Last week, we talked about um, the sword and the staff, how there are two stories present around this time of Advent and particularly pronounced in our lectionary readings for Advent as we lead up for Christmas. Last week, we talked about the sword and the staff. This week, we talked about, we're going to talk about the eagle and the dove. And you'll notice on your bulletin cover how those two symbols are displayed in puzzle pieces. And that's because there is this idea that when you talk about two stories and how the symbols fit, in particular as we get going in the weeks um, leading up to Christmas, the more puzzle pieces you have, the clearer the picture is of what it is we mean when we talk about um, the, the images that are present in the gospel stories, but also the cultural symbols that are present and were present at the time of Jesus. And so uh, to name that and, and sort of uh, really amplify that, we have a painting that will be revealed on Christmas Eve um, that displays all of these symbols in a, in a scene uh, painted by Joel Scuntanis, our artist in residence. And if you're a puzzling kind of people, then you can also order a puzzle, and you can order it by Wednesday. And we just want to make sure that you know that. Maybe you've seen that in the bulletin or in uh, the newsletter, but there's opportunity for you to purchase this, and included in that will be a devotional so that maybe you want to get it out again next year or in a couple of years and uh, go through and, and uh, think about these themes again. You can do that if you so desire. So I just don't want to, or I want to make sure that nobody misses that if that's something you're interested in. Thank you. All right, friends. The beginning of Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Here, these words from our Holy Scripture. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the, Jordan, in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days... Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. To declare a beginning is risky. To declare a beginning to something, a new something, is a risky idea. Almost as risky as embarking on the beginning itself. To declare that there is a beginning is risky. To say that something is starting, beginning, that what happened before is now in the past, and we have a different relationship with the past than the present or the future. We can learn from it, grow from it, apply it to where we are going, but now it is in the past, and it is not our future any longer. To declare a beginning is risky, but it's also important. We walked through this idea of beginning this fall, when we talked about the creation narratives, 
it wasn't the first creation narrative ever written that we have in our Bible, actually. It comes after other creation narratives. But what's so amazing about the creation narrative in Holy Scripture is that it proclaims a beginning that is different from the beginnings that were already being talked about. Not a beginning of chaos, of violence, of war, but of love, of goodness, a, a creation of God's shalom, wholeness for all things. That's, that's the beginning in the face of other beginnings. To declare a beginning means that we have hope, an opportunity to move ahead. So, maybe the next obvious question is, if there is a beginning, what is the beginning about, and what are we to do about it today, and why should we care? Well, for that we turn to Mark's Christmas story. And you might be saying, wait a minute, Mark doesn't have a Christmas story. Yes, Mark does have a Christmas story. It is the very first verse of Mark. It's the very first verse. Chapter 1, verse 1. Do you want me to read it again, or do you got it? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Succinct. Total. That is Mark's Christmas story. Let me explain. The good news. The beginning. So we've, we've talked about a beginning. To declare a beginning is risky, but that's what Mark does. It isn't the beginning to anything in the world as it knows it. Right? There is already a well-established order to things. Rome is well on the road. It knows what it's doing. It has changed from republic to empire rather um, quickly with Julius Caesar and then Caesar Augustus. And what we read is at the time that Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus is in power, the territory of Rome is vast, the cultural influence of Rome is affecting everything. The economy, the politics, the way people interacted with one another, with the world, with their own idea and concepts of God and philosophy and meaning are all being impacted by the way the empire functions. So to declare that there is a beginning in the middle of something so well established is a dangerous thing to do. It's a dangerous thing to do. And it wouldn't be the last time, particularly for Israel, that they would try this. In the Roman revolt, I don't know if you know this, that ultimately got the temple destroyed, Jews began to print new coins with a year zero on them. We're starting over. There is a new beginning. To declare a new beginning is a risky idea because it means that you have done something, that the old order of things doesn't work anymore. So to simply say, hey, this is the beginning, is a dangerous decision and a dangerous declaration. It's even more dangerous to actually believe it and to live as though it's true. It is the beginning. The beginning of what? Well, the good news, of course. The good news of Jesus the Messiah. Now, the good news isn't a new word either. The word gospel, or euangelion in the Greek, isn't a new word. It's an established word. It has a, wor it has a set of meaning that is important. The word good news, the word gospel, is a military word. It's a word that means a battle had been won. And when your army is off fighting other places, and you don't know whether they're winning or losing, to hear that there is good news, to hear that a gospel is being pronounced, means that your army won. That they, you, we, us, our kingdom, our people, we won. The other side, they lost, but that doesn't matter. We won the gospel. Hear the gospel. We won. This is good news. So the gospel, according to Rome, was that there was a military victory. 
And this announcement that came with, uh, to announce a military victory and military fanfare was also was accompanied by a military symbol. One of the most predominant symbols of the Roman Empire was, of course, the eagle, a strong and powerful bird, a big bird. I spent too much of my week watching YouTube videos about how big and powerful eagles really are. Sidebar, I said I wasn't going to do this, but now I'm going to do it because, like, it's just too crazy. You need to know this. Did you know that bald eagles will pick sheep and goats and rams off the sides of mountains. They're big enough to do that, to lift them off, and then they drop them, and they crash onto the rocks, and they have food, right? Like, that is amazing. I didn't know they could do that. A few years ago, we were vacationing up north, and we were, uh, we were having a great, uh, great time, and my aunt, who is a vet up north, told us this story about how dogs had been disappearing in town, right? And people were coming, where are the dogs? Where are the dogs? And it, then a, a violent storm blew down a very tall tree, and in that tree was an eagle's nest, and in that eagle's nest were a bunch of collars. Eagles are big, huge uh, predator birds, like wild stuff, right? So anyway, th this, is, this is the image that Rome wanted to project, a strong military empire. Uh, when you see the eagle, you should fear because something more powerful than you, bigger than you, something that could pick you up and drop you, could crush you in its talons, could tear at your flesh with its beak, that's the image. We're bigger and stronger than you. Fear us. So, the good news of Rome is the image of the eagle. That's what's happening. And it is, remember, we, we, uh, there's this guy named Herod. Herod's temple is what's around at the time. Uh, we're going to talk more about Herod in a couple of weeks, but Herod is the guy that had all of the newborn males killed up to a certain uh, age in Bethlehem because he heard from a couple of wise men uh, that there was a king born to the Jews. Herod was a puppet of Rome. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But in uh, the Herod's temple was great, vast, impressive in scope and in size. And the Jews were relatively proud of Herod's temple. Until that is, that Herod had placed in the holy building, in the holy city of God, remember that the temple is the image of where God meets God's people and grace and mercy is dispensed and peace and wholeness are known. That's the place. It's here that Herod hung a huge golden eagle over the gate on behalf of the Roman Empire. And when there was a conspiracy to yank the eagle down, these men were found, and Herod had them burned alive. The eagle. Fear it. Know it. That is the place. And this is fresh in Mark's memory as he is writing the gospel down. This is part of a not-so-distant past. But it is right there for him. And so for Mark to declare in the very first half of the first verse that, the, that the, his book, what he's writing about, is the new beginning of the gospel. Of who? Not of Caesar and not of Rome, but who? The Messiah, Jesus. That's who we're talking about the first verse that we sometimes read over so quickly just so we get to the, well, prepare the way of the Lord and let's light a candle as we talk about that. This first verse is, would get somebody killed if they talked about it in the Roman Empire when Mark is writing. If the church was in possession of such a letter, it would be dangerous. Their lives are at risk because the eagle 
of the good news of Rome is ever watching. And what is that gospel? What is it? How does Mark declare it and define it? How does it get worked out? The gospel for our shorthand, as we will read it in the totality of Mark's gospel and in all of the New Testament, <clears throat> is really the declaration that God's covenant promises have come true in and through Jesus, the Messiah, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the reign of God is being established. That is what the gospel is. And it contains so much. And when we talk about what the gospel is as a church, sometimes we'll use shorthands like, what's the gospel? Well, Jesus Christ died for my sins. That's what it means. And yes, that's a part of it, a very important part, an integral part of it, a part that even our text for today uh, addresses, talking about how when there is a new beginning and a new gospel that is declared, make your way down to the river. It's time to repent and turn around for God is doing a new thing. Absolutely. It means forgiveness. It means there is hope and wholeness. It means that we as a people are called to repentance for the brokenness that we participate in and the brokenness that we bear witness to, which is why we speak it and pray it and long for wholeness and assurance every single week. That's why we do it. But that is not all of the gospel, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And that reduction is a dangerous reduction. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When Jesus comes to announce that there is good news, when John the baptizer is in the river declaring that there is good news that one will come after, that will bring the Holy Spirit, that one will come, uh, that, one will come that brings healing and wholeness, peace, we do so in a story of repentance. Repentance. And so when Jesus shows up, when Jesus shows up and he himself is baptized by John and identifies with all of the brokenness and yearning and longing in the world, a sign not of an eagle but of a dove shows up. The hope of peace and wholeness resting there, the very Holy Spirit of God dwelling with Jesus, the promise of peace, the declaration of a different gospel. So here is why this matters, Third Reformed Church. <clears throat> because in approximately 21 days, it will be the year 2024. And it will be a presidential election year. And all indications are that we will have the same ticket that we had in 2020. Y'all remember 2020? Wasn't that fun? You guys remember? It was a good time, I think. I had a stomach ache for about a month straight. That's where we are. And the fact that there's limited nervous laughter amongst all of you means that you do, in fact, remember it. You know it well. We're already hearing messages about who can save and what they can save us from, the hope that they bring, the promises that they make, that their candidate will be our Savior. They are the ones that can save us from the situation that we're in. When we deal in a gospel that is flattened into not the full gospel that Mark presents just in one short sentence. That nothing in this world is not impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's a beginning of a new thing. Of that all the promises of God are true. That once you say the word Messiah, it matters for the whole universe and all of creation is impact. As soon as you name the word Messiah, it, it uh, enters the stream of a prophetic tradition like Isaiah who tell us that everything will be healed. 
that it's time to flatten the mountains and raise up the valleys because Jesus is coming, that God is on the move and has not abandoned the world. So there is the beginning of a good news proclamation that's different and promises this whole world of peace and wholeness. But when we flatten that gospel, then what we are allowed to do is say that the gospel does not impact things like economics and politics and elections and business dealings. It doesn't affect our morality. It doesn't affect what we, we do with other people. It doesn't affect what we do with ourselves. It doesn't affect what we do with creation. It doesn't affect any of it because it's just me and Jesus. When we flatten the gospel, things like Christian nationalism show up. That's what happens. We shouldn't be surprised that we're here. Because we have flattened the gospel into simply Jesus forgiving our sins, which is true and we should rejoice. But when Mark is penning these words, he's penning them between the opposition, between the way the empire is and what God is doing in the world and promises to do in the world. When we allow the eagle of America to be just as destructive as the eagle of Rome, we are missing the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we don't have words to say about what's happening with elections, both local and national, when we don't have words to speak and postures to, to take around difficult things happening around our world that do impact our pocketbook and our politics, that do impact our voting and the vulnerable, then we are not declaring, as Mark did, a new gospel, but simply a way that we can pass the time with our so-called salvation. I know I'm offering you a hard word, Third Reformed Church. I know. But this is an important moment. Mark had an important task to declare the good news of Jesus Christ and how that good news was not another way to live in empire, but a way that was different from empire altogether. When we declare a, a word of peace and a kingdom of peace as Mark does, we don't declare it as representatives and puppets of an empire only to put their symbols over ours, as Herod does. No, we're to call from the wilderness and flatten mountains and raise valleys and wear clothes that are a bit uncomfortable and act a bit goofy and eat locusts. If you haven't done it, I heard we should try. I haven't, I don't know. But <clears throat> we are to be uh, outside of the system altogether, declaring that God's way of the world is different and calling us to something radical and revolutionary. We won't get peace by trying to reinvent the same system of empire. We won't. So, here's the good news. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but at this point in the sermon, I need some. The good news come in the waters of baptism. Because that's the kingdom I'm concerned about. And that's the kingdom that we're called into. Next November will come, and there will be results that we have to deal with and live into. And some of those may be frightening for us. And that's natural. It's normal. It's the eagle of empire 
it shouldn't surprise us that it's a bit unnervy. But it's the water of baptism which marks us and calls us. It's the one where Jesus, it's the one where Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit gives us a new identity. His, his very identity. Co-heirs with Christ called to bring the good news in the same spirit that broke down the symbol of peace now rests upon God's people, the church. So here's the good news. The spirit that rested on Jesus in the waters of baptism, the love that God has shown for Jesus the Son is the same love that God extends to us. The same spirit that rested on Jesus is the same spirit that is in you. The same Jesus who conquered sin and death and told a different story of empire is the Jesus in whose name we gather and are called. That's the kingdom that we're concerned about. And it's a kingdom not of the eagle but of the dove. And the way of the dove is peace and wholeness That's the calling we take up. And we do it with each other. And we do it in the Spirit. So, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, prepare the way of the Lord. Make plain the ways of the Lord. Knock down mountains if you have to. Raise up valleys if you have to. But proclaim peace where there's conflict. Proclaim hope in a world that is in despair. Declare the gospel of Jesus where the the empire has full market value. Declare it. Bear witness to it today. And let's do so together. Let us pray. Oh God, would you please come and bring your wholeness for we long for your world to be made right. And in some days we live in the fear of what may happen next in the world in which we live. There are people in power who frighten us. There are people in power who continue to take advantage of the poor and the vulnerable. But you have said that there is a different way to live. Help us live the way of peace, O Prince, which you have called us into. Give us your spirit and come quickly, come quickly, Lord Jesus, to attend to us in our need. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
As we continue in worship, I invite all of you to find the fellowship pads on the ends of your pews to sign in. Uh, whether you're a member or a visitor, we'd love to hear from you that you've been with us. Uh, if there's a way that we can serve you as a church and um, connect with you as well, especially if we don't already have your contact information. In the spirit of fellowship, I want to offer a very warm welcome to uh, friends of ours, longtime friends of Third Reformed Church, Roland Jr. and Jane Vaness. Would you stand so that we can greet you this morning? We do this especially because Roland Jr. and Jane are missionaries that our congregation supports. You can read more about them um, in our church communications, and we're so glad that you are here with us to worship with us um, and for all of the ways that you are sharing God's light and his love um, in your ministry and in your speaking here nearby. We give thanks to God, and we will, add you to our, we will conclude you in our prayers this morning. Thanks, Roland and Jane. I want to let the congregation know some details about our week together. Um, there will not be lift this week. We have uh, wrapped up for this semester and will resume in January. Um, but on Thursday, there's an opportunity for those of you who are available um, at about 11.10 a.m. There is a show choir singing group with uh, holiday pieces that one of our schools that many of our kids participate in um, will be coming here to share. So the vocal dimensions from Holland High will come and there will be a cookie reception on Thursday at 11.10. On Sunday night, you are invited to our choir service. We will be led in carols and in scripture um, by your pastors and by your choir. And uh, we hope that you will not only come, but that you'll think of who you might like to offer a ride to, to go together. Um, maybe someone who isn't a part of our church who would be blessed to hear the good news of Jesus uh, at this Advent time. I want to let you know that next week, Sunday, is the last week of Sunday school. So uh, families, especially with children participating in Sunday school, um, be aware of that. And that on December 31, we will have one service um, at 11.30 a.m. So if you recall, uh, about a month ago, uh, the second service joined the first, and now we are inviting you, the first service, to join our service at 11.30. There will be a brunch at 10 a.m. to get you started and to have us uh, have a chance to greet one another. This will be a sign-up brunch, and there will be an opportunity to sign up for what you might like to bring. And this preacher for that morning will be our, one of our other mission partners, Pastor Samuel Lopez, um, co-preaching with Pastor Angel. Today we have our regular offerings of Sunday school um, for all ages as well as our Spanish service, El Encuentro at 11.30, Sunday school at 11.15, El Encuentro at 11.30. And I want to let you know that if you've come desiring prayer, that there is a prayer room through the east doors and members of our church are there to pray with you following the service. For our offertory this morning, we have um, another one of our mission partners to share with us. Marta Amara will join us via a video that she has made to tell us about opportunities to pray for and support ministry in Mexico where she and her husband Jaime serve. So at this time, I invite our deacons to come forward to collect this morning's offerings and tithes and for the congregation to hear about the ministry that Marta will tell us about. Hello, I'm Martha Amaro. Many of you know us as Jaime and Martha Amaro. Uh, my husband is not currently here to record this video, but received greetings from Mexico from him too. Jaime and I have been serving in Oaxaca, Mexico for the last 23 years. It is our pleasure to be able to share with you an update of our life in mission for the last three years. As you know, we have been having this dream for a long time about 
of planting a church. Six years ago, a dream started with the land, and now we are so thankful to share with you about the dedication of the building for a grace upon grace church in Santo Domingo, Oaxaca. Everything started with a children's club. Every Saturday, our staff, our team, Oaxaca, Mexico, went to do this children's club. We have Bible, Bible lessons, arts, crafts, and have a lot of fun. Uh, along with this process, families were touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now we are so thankful. We celebrate for first time our first worship service. Children and worship continues. We are still training across Mexico. We are now a large team of trainers in a different regions. Every year, we offer an annual training down in Yucatan Peninsula to share the new BBS program to be run for every summer. Uh, we also have our children and worship training for new leaders, an introduction of the program, and then we book trainings from there. This year, we also celebrate our partnership with the Christian Reformed Church in Cuba a new team travel, and then we carry the materials. They were made with so much love in Oaxaca. Jaime put all his heart, he couldn't travel, but he made the figures for the churches to run the program, and more churches were training this year. This is going to be an annual trip to Cuba to share with them. Cuba is a country with a lack of everything, so our love is shown through the love of Jesus, with your donations, our effort, and God's protection. Thanks for Cuban churches doing the work among the young kids in Cuba. As a result of the children's club and the church is starting to work, we are going to start a new school year with the educational center at Santo Domingo. Our focus is 7 to ninth grade. Those kids are in high risk in Oaxaca, Mexico. All kind of things are around except education. So we receive an awesome donation from Detroit. We do have the laptops now. Now we need the scholarships. $200 can make a difference. And here is what $200 do for a young life. They're gonna pay full tuition for a full year and all materials he will need to complete one school year. Please support this new project of our ministry in Mexico. You can go to the webpage of RCA and donate for this specific cause or contact our supervisor. May the Lord bless you and keep you safe. Thank you for all these years working with us, doing missions together, hand by hand, with your support, your prayers, and our heart for missions. Dios les bendiga.
As we continue with our prayers, we offer our condolences and our prayers for the Reyes family, uh, Alma, Litsi, Karime, and Azul. Uh, Alma's mother passed away this week, and so we will pray for them in the loss of a mother and grandmother. Would you join with me as we pray? God, you fill our hearts. Your hope is before us, and our hearts wait for you. We wait on you, God, for all that we see you doing and unfolding in us and around us, and for all that we long for to see your promises made complete. We pray, God, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would show us the way where we don't see a way forward, that you would transform how we encounter your world and that in us and through us, our world would see you. And because we have this hope, because you have placed it in it and renew it and restore it and revive it in us every time we speak your name and your Holy Spirit is at work in us, God, we pray as a congregation for our own church family and for this world. We lift up to you, beloved members of our church family, who we cherish in your love, Margaret Dornboss and Donna Prins, Barb Piaget and Beth Dumay, Ruth Heideman, Mary Borson, and Bob and Ellie Kuyper. We pray for them, God, for you to pour your love over them, for them to experience your presence. And we lift them up and give thanks for them in Jesus' name. We pray, God, for those struggling in different and difficult ways with their health. We lift up Phyllis Brown to you, God. We pray that you would use the knowledge and wisdom of those around her and your healing, God, to give her strength, to give her the help that she needs, and that your presence would be with her and Harley. We lift up Carl Folkert to you, God, in hospital again with a severe infection after surgery. And we pray in Jesus' name for healing in every way that his body and spirit needs. We pray for strength and wellness to be able to finish chemo as planned. We pray that you would lift his pain and that you would give strength and hope to him and to Barb and that you would hold them close in your love and grant them and their whole family all that they need in the assurance that you are always with them. We lift up Alma and Litsi and Karime and Asul as they grieve the loss of Alma's mother and the girl's abuelita on Thursday. We pray for your peace for them in the passing of a mother and grandmother and the profound longing of being so far away at a time like this. Comfort them, Lord, and help them to trust in you at this time. We give you thanks, God, for the gift of a new grandson to Lori and Steve Orlo. We pray for little Theo and his parents as Theo has surgery today for such a little person. And so we ask, God, for you to grant your healing and to help them as a family, and to give them all that they need in this time. Fulfill their joy, God, and help him to be well. God, in a time when there is so much superficial joy adorning our homes and the places that we go, so many songs about being happy that don't remind us that our best happiness and our greatest joy is in you, that our only help and hope is in you. We pray for all the ways that we, your people, need your healing for hearts and spirits, for broken bodies, for disrupted lives, for divided families.
we pray that everything true about your promise through your Holy Spirit, you would enliven in us and among us, and that we would not settle for cheap joy. Where we need to lift one another up in hope. Give us eyes and hearts to do so as the body of Christ you are making us to be. God, for all the ways you are proclaiming hope and peace in the world, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Jaime and Marta, for Roland and Jane, for Albino and Sandy, for these mission partners that you have called, with whom you have joined us in sharing a good news the world cannot find outside of your name. We pray that you would bless them that you would renew your help and strength in them and through them, that you would shine in their teaching, in their serving, in their leading, and in their pointing to your way of peace and your promises. We pray with longing and broken hearts at the devastation in Gaza and for all the ways that war is making havoc in Palestine and Israel. We pray for a path to peace to end bloodshed. We cry out for a peace that will last. And we cry to you, God alone, for who can know the broken lives and hearts and homes more than you? We pray for the war in Ukraine and for the unthinkable weariness of another winter in the nightmare of wartime. We pray for families who have empty chairs and places. We pray for peoples who are caught in a constant uncertainty and wishfulness for safety. And we grant, we pray, Lord, that you would hear their prayers and that you would grant peace. We pray for all who are powerless. And we beg you, God, for your help, for food, for shelter and protection for any kind of hope, but most of all, the hope that comes from you. And we pray for the powerful. And we call on you to stay their hands and guide them in justice and righteousness for your namesake and for the sake of mercy, and that you, God, would bring to bear mighty and everlasting one, your peace, of which one day there will be no end. And so we pray with longing hearts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. church, go in the name of the Prince of Peace. 
go accompanied by the Holy Spirit and go bearing and witness to the kingdom of God our Father that it may come on earth as it is in heaven. And may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit attend to you now and until we meet again. Amen.